Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. One of the most fundamental observations for centuries regarding the shape of the Earth has been objects disappearing from view bottom up. In exactly the same way as we see other things go out of view bottom first over curved surfaces. Flat Earthers though of course need to provide alternate explanations for bottom up obstruction. In recent videos I've tackled claims that it's changing atmospheric conditions. Those are too inconsistent and not always matching what we should see if those were the case. And I've also tackled claims that it's perspective allowing small objects nearby to obscure distant objects due to angular size differences. Which is flat earthers getting perspective completely wrong. And today I'll be tackling a demonstration I've seen multiple flat earthers put forward of apparent proof that bottom up obstruction would naturally occur across a flat surface. The demonstration in question involves placing a camera at the end of a table and then moving an object along the table away from the camera and it disappears bottom first. But then when they zoom the camera in, the object comes back into view. Which then leads towards the claim that we can zoom objects back into view after they've gone beyond the horizon. However, it may come as a surprise to very few people that that is not actually the case. So today we'll cover why there are flaws in their demonstration, the crazy effects of optics that can make it appear as though they are zooming objects back into view, and I'll even throw in a bonus debunk of everyone's favourite demonstrable realist who has recently fallen foul to the exact same misconceptions seen in some ISS footage. Because at the end of the day, you know, I can see how those demonstrations could m lead people to believe that objects would disappear from view bottom first over a flat surface. And we're all human, so, you know, everyone gets stuff wrong from time to time. I don't think there should be any shame in getting things wrong. I, I see it as an opportunity to learn from it and learn something new, which is one of the reasons I love using Brilliant.org, who are sponsoring this video. Brilliant makes learning easy and enjoyable with its use of simple and interactive animations for classes across maths, science and computing. As you learn a new topic, you'll be questioned on it to see if you're understanding it, and if you get the question wrong, they provide you with a clear breakdown of an explanation so that you can see where you went wrong and be able to learn from it. Regular viewers of this channel know how much I enjoy using Brilliant, and my daily streak of using it still continues. I'm now up to 384 consecutive days. So why not see if you'd enjoy it as much as I am with a 30-day free trial by visiting my link brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan, and if you do so, you'll also be eligible for 20% off their annual subscription. Now, the first thing with this demonstration is the obvious question. Are we certain that the camera is correctly aligned with the table? Is it looking just across the surface as should be the case for a flat earth representation, or is the camera actually slightly below the table? Well, the demonstration that was done by Mitchell from Australia tries to address this issue by lifting the camera up and then lowering it back down. Nice flat table, no physical obstruction. This is all optical. Except when he lowers the camera back down, it looks suspiciously as though the camera is slightly below level. Level would be when the near end of the table is perfectly in line with the far end, just as though the table were being extended out into the camera. However, in his footage, it does seem as though the camera continues down slightly further than that point. Although it's difficult to tell from the footage because it's not perfectly clear where the ends of the table really are, partly due to the low quality of the image and partly due to the highly reflective tabletop, which is reflecting the wall in the background, making it really difficult to tell where the far end of the table actually is. However, the reflections of the chairs on the table do give us a clearer indication of where the side edge of the table is. And I would argue at this point, the camera is actually level with the table, but it then proceeds to drop slightly further than this. So it looks like Mitchell from Australia's footage is below the table. It's hard to tell from Flat Out Truth's video though, because he doesn't raise the camera up to show us. Now, Game Changer's setup is definitely below the table, but I'll get on to how we know that in a moment. Firstly, though, I need to make sure that everyone is familiar with depth of field, because that's going to be very important to this. Depth of field refers to the areas of the image in front or behind of the subject that you're focusing on. 
basically the areas which are out of focus. So if you see a portrait, for example, with the background very blurred, this is referred to as having a shallow depth of field. Whereas images like landscape photos, where everything is clear from very close to far away, is said to have a deep depth of field. I find it easier to think of it as depth of focus, and it's affected by three factors. Focal length, aperture ratio, and subject distance. Although the focal length and aperture ratio are kind of linked. If you were to take lines from either side of the lens's iris opening and have them cross each other on the subject, that is the point where the lens is focusing on and thus is perfectly in focus. As those lines get further apart, things get more out of focus. If you physically open the iris up, then the lines are starting further apart from each other and thus will move away from each other quicker, so things will drop out of focus faster than if we had the aperture closed down. When we zoom in, we're actually magnifying the appearance of the iris across the front of the lens, and so again the lines will be starting further apart, and so things will fall out of focus sooner, whereas zooming out to a shorter focal length creates a deeper depth of field. And last but not least is distance. With the camera right up to the edge of the table, the difference in distances between the camera to either end of the table is huge. So if we focus on the closest end of the table, the far end of it goes out of focus. If we focus on the far end, then the near end goes out of focus. Now, I recreated the setup along this countertop behind me, but I did it in a more controlled manner. The camera I used was my Sony a7 IV with a Tamron 28 to 75 mm lens. Because on this lens, there's a little white marker which is used as a guide to align where the lens mounts to the camera. But when the lens is locked in place, it sits exactly in the middle of the lens mount, meaning it's running across the middle of the sensor. So I placed a spirit level onto the camera to ensure that the camera was sitting level. And when I lifted the camera so that the marker on the lens was meeting the bottom of the level, I knew the surface of the counter is sitting exactly halfway up the camera lens. And when I place an object in front of the camera and then move it back, the bottom does not go out of view. Now Game Changer used a very similar setup. They also had a spirit level sticking off the edge of the table, except you can clearly see the underside of their spirit level. And the underside of the spirit level is rising up in the frame as you get closer to the camera, meaning the camera is below the underside of the spirit level and thus below the top of the table. I can only reproduce the flat earth as results of disappearing bottom first when I lower the camera down slightly, which obviously isn't possible on a flat earth unless you're standing in a ditch. Another clue that this demonstration from flat earthers is flawed is that their objects begin disappearing as soon as they move them away from the camera, which is not what we see in reality. In reality, they appear to rise up first and then start becoming obstructed whilst dropping down which we can produce perfectly on a table, as long as the table has a curved top to it. However, you might be thinking, hold on, if the camera is lower than the top of the table, then why did zooming in bring the object back into view? Shouldn't it just have zoomed into the edge of the table? And this is where things get pretty cool in my opinion. When I first saw this demonstration being done, one thing I immediately noticed is that when the object in question is getting moved back, the camera focus does not move with it. If the camera focus was set to follow the object, then as it moves back, the camera would shift to track it, or at least track the person's hand. This would cause the near edge of the table to move out of focus, but it doesn't. The camera's focus is staying fixed on the edge of the table and the object is moving out of focus. Now, all camera optics have what is called a minimum focus distance, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's the shortest distance away from the sensor that a lens is able to render an object in focus. Now, the distance varies between lenses depending on their optical design, but the general rule of thumb is that lenses with longer focal lengths have further minimum focus distances than shorter focal lengths, unless you go down the route of specialized lenses called macro lenses, which are designed to allow closer than normal focusing and are what is generally used for close-up detail shots of objects. However, in any zoom lens, at least that I can think of, 
The shortest focusing distance is always on the widest end of the lens, and it increases as you increase the focal length. For example, my 28 to 75 millimeter lens, at 28 millimeters, it can focus down to about 18 centimeters, but at 75 millimeters, it can only focus to 38 centimeters. So as I zoom in, the minimum focus distance is actually increasing whether I like it or not. And that is what is basically happening here with the table in the Flat Earthers example. The camera's autofocus has locked onto the table edge, which is why it doesn't shift when the object gets moved back. But once they zoom in, the minimum focus distance is getting pushed back, so the edge of the table is going out of focus, and the focus is moving towards the object at the far end. I can actually reproduce this same effect of bringing objects back into view without even zooming in. As we covered earlier, zooming in creates a shallower depth of field because it's magnifying the apparent size of the iris opening. So not only when they zoom in is the minimum focus distance being pushed back towards the object, but the iris is being magnified so that it can appear more over the top of the counter. In the footage at the moment, the camera is set to f22, which is the smallest iris opening this lens will allow, and the bottom of the object is clearly obscured by the countertop. However, without zooming in, if I just open the iris up from f22 up to f2.8, the iris is now much bigger, and part of it can see over the top of the counter, and the bottom of the object now comes into view. As long as part of the lens has line of sight to the object, the obstructions can be blurred out of view. Photographers use this regularly to their advantage. Common examples are having things like tree branches or fairy lights just in front of the lens and then focusing on something way off in the distance so that that obstruction in the lens becomes massively out of focus and leaves just blurry remains, which photographers do just to add some character to the photo. I mean, one of my favorite photographs that I have ever taken was this of a tiger crouched down by a shallow pond. I shot this with a 200 millimeter lens and I was standing less than 10 meters from the tiger. Now, I would like to make it clear, I am not suicidal. This was actually taken at Chester Zoo and there was a chain link fence between me and the tiger, but because I had the camera so close to the fence and the tiger was set back from it, despite the fence going right across the front of the lens, it's being pushed so far out of focus that you just can't see it anymore, but you can clearly see everything that is beyond it. And this actually links us perfectly to the bonus debunk of Level Earth Observer, who recently put out a video claiming that footage taken on the ISS by Russian cosmonauts is apparently clearly CGI. And that's what I want you guys just to pay well, have a closer look at it, should we say. That silver seal, it looks like it's got little rivets in it. SpaceX Dragon capsule and that satellite dish up here are about to go through the window sill of the Russian section of the International Space Station. Ridiculous. <laughs> That's ridiculous, lads. Now, you may have noticed the camera's focus jumps to and from the window frame. When it's focused on the window, the window frame has hard edges to it, but when the focus shifts to outside, the window frame goes out of focus, which is when the antenna becomes visible through it. Now, here is the original video which Elio has taken the footage from. I'll link it below, but at 2 minutes 33 seconds, we can see the, the antennas are visible through the blurred window edges. But as they start to zoom the lens out, which increases the depth of field, the window frame is now brought more into focus and the antennas become obscured. Which is exactly what we would expect to see from camera optics, as I've already demonstrated. I wonder if the demonstrable realist will accept this demonstrable fact that can be tested and verified by all. Well, that's going to be a wrap. If you've enjoyed this and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.